Greetings to you guys in the wonderful name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Um, we're doing a pre recording for the 27th of December. The topic we're looking at this evening is rightly dividing. Rightly dividing. It's taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, if you have the King James Bible. Other translations would call it um, how to handle the word, but it's particularly used here as rightly dividing. To give you an illustration, Paul was a tent maker, and to make the tents, they would use camel hide. And camel hide was very tough. And to be able to cut camel hide, you had to know how to rightly divide it. And you had to be circumspect. And you couldn't just cut it. As we know, you measure twice, you cut once. And uh, so he was very skilled. And as he was as skilled, and knowledgeable in the ability to work with camel hide and the difficulties that it, uh, that it um, incurred, so was he skilled with operating the word of the Lord. He showed the, he showed the same due diligence with the word of the Lord. So it tells us in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved of the Lord, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing rightly dividing the word of truth. It actually, interesting enough, goes on in verse 16 of that same passage. So in verse 15 it says, study the word of God. And in verse 16 it says, and shun profane and vain babblings. So as much as we ought to study the word, we ought to know what to shun. So you have the study and the shun as you rightly dividing the word of truth. So rightly dividing, I've summed it up into seven parities. It's just my own notes that I've done over the last couple of years as I've been putting them onto YouTube. So um, I may be able to give you a couple of back uh, copies to, to look at if there's a particular area that you need more knowledge on with regards to the seven parities. I could have put um, uh, the seven disparities, but disparities means it favors one and not the other. So I've used seven parities so that there's, uh, there's no prejudice between the one or the other. And you'll see what I mean as we go through. Um, so the Word of God tells us in 3 Timothy, sorry, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, it says that all Scripture is inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, when we look at rightly dividing, we need to understand that in the Word of God, in the Bible, all 66 of the Bible, 66 books of the Bible, we need to rightly divide as to what is for the body of Christ, what is for us as Christians, and what is for the Jew. So, the, the simplest form, the easiest way, the most common, which people would automatically do, is they would divide, one of the parities that they would do with rightly dividing is the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And I think all of us would agree that the Old Testament, generally speaking, is for the Jew, Israel, Israelites, and the New Testament is for the Christians. And that's a division. It's even divided into the Bible um, so you've got your 39 books, Old Testament, and then you've got your New Testament, your 27. When we discern that more closely, what we discover is that essentially the first four gospel books are still largely for Israel. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus Christ says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. And the theme is still for the Jews. They're still under the law. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, uh, it's for the Jews in how it's the constitution in how they ought to live during uh, the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. Um, so a lot of what happens in those four gospel books is for the Jew. Then you've got, for instance, the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transition book. It starts off with Jerusalem with Peter, with the Jews, with them converting 3,000 in one day. For instance, 
in the upper room. And then it goes to the Gentiles. And Acts chapter 28, 28 essentially says the word of the Lord goes to the Gentiles throughout all the world. So you've got a transition. It starts in Jerusalem, but goes to the end of the world. It starts with Peter, but goes to Paul. And what we know from uh, the book of Galatians that even they saw that uh, Peter was going to be ministering to the Jews and Paul was going to be the apostle to minister to the Gentile. So again, there's this parity between uh, Peter for the, for the Jews and Paul for, and much of the New Testament was written, all 13 books were given to Paul from Romans to Philemon, um, as he wrote. So, so, what, so what you've got in the New Testament is you've got those 13 books, Romans to Philemon, and then after Romans to Philemon, your next book is actually called the book of Hebrews. The book itself is addressed to the Jews in Jerusalem, the book of Hebrews. The book following that is the book of James. The book of James is addressed to the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, it's addressed to the Jews. The book of James quotes the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The book of James quotes the Sermon on the Mount 22 times. The book of James was written before the books that Paul wrote because James was not influenced by Paul. Paul wasn't around yet when James wrote his book to the Jews and how ought they to live with the coming tribulation and the millennium, which is for them, which we'll get to. The book of Revelation, for instance, it opens up the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a revelation for the Christians. The Christians know from reading Romans to Philemon, they know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is Lord. But it becomes a revelation to the Jew when their eyes are open. And they can look upon him whom they have pierced. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, He says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace which is brought you by the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, again, Peter follows here, and it's got to do with the Jews and calling them to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ which the 13 books of the Bible, the book of Romans, tells us. Romans is the, the, the key book of the doctrine of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. How we're not saved by the Lord, but we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We already know that. Our eyes have been opened to this. So, the first parity that we have is that we see there's an old and a new, but within the new, there's, there's books that are written for the Jew. Not all for us. All scripture is inspired of God. All scripture is inspired. Not all scripture is for us. For instance, the book of Leviticus is not addressed to us. It's, Levit it's addressed to the Levite priests. The book of Hebrews. Now we can take application from these books. We can take application from Hebrews. We can take application from James. Martin Luther wished he could burn the book of James. Because although he could take application, he couldn't, he couldn't fit it in. Why? Because the book of James kept regurgitating the stuff from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount, which is for the Jew, how the Jew ought to live during, it's the constitution for the Jew, how he ought to live during the time of the tribulation and the millennium. The other one is heaven and earth. The Bible begins in Genesis 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular, and earth. I've touched on why heaven is singular. The King James Bible is singular. Modern transversions are plural. Plural is not correct. Plural becomes correct in Genesis 2 verse 1. King James, it's plural in Genesis 2. But it's not plural in the beginning. And there's a reason for that. And... You can look, I think, um, my Bible teaching number 89, 84, and I think I did another one around about 56, which will give you insight into that. I'll give you why it was, it was singular. Heaven and earth. There's a distinction, there's a parity between heaven and earth. The Christians are God's heavenly people. 
We seated in heavenly places, places with Christ Jesus. We is heavenly crown. The Jews are his earthly people. The meek shall inherit the earth. Christ comes and he sets up his millennial kingdom on earth. On the throne of David. In Jerusalem. We his heavenly people, the Christians, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Heavenly. The earth. For the Jews, the Israelites. There's a distinction. There's a parity. Isaiah speaks about the heavens plural and the earth. Isaiah chapter 65. John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, speaks about heaven singular, earth, Revelation 21. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 19, it tells us about God, that the Most High God is the possessor of both heaven and earth. He's God of both, heaven and earth. There's so much more I can say, but I'm just giving you the parities of rightly dividing. That you'll see God is working now with His heavenly people. And then after the rapture, the door is shut, and He, starts, he returns and He starts to work with His earthly people, the Jew. He's busy with us now, the Christian. So the, the obvious number three is Jew versus Gentile. Now there's a distinction. You get Jews and you get Gentiles. There are two types of people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 32 it tells us, and give none offense neither to the Jew nor to the Gentile nor to the church of God. When you get saved, Galatians chapter 3, 28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. We all become Christians. So, since Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, since Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he's the father of the Jewish nation. The Jew. So God's got a pain for the Jew. The Gentiles were grafted in when Jews rejected Jesus. He grafted us in. And we became his heavenly people. The earth rebelled against him. And heaven rebelled against him. When Lucifer fell with a third of the angels. So that's why he's going to create in Revelation, well, Isaiah 65, Revelation 21, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. I've told you before, in one of these, I think it could be this one, I said if you look at the days of creation, the seven days of, uh, the six days of creation and the day of the rest, it's on day two when the firmament in the sky, it doesn't say that it was good. It's the only day, day two. Where God doesn't say that what He created was good. Because of what Lucifer's, Lucifer's rebellion happened. Now there's arguments with Christian as to when Lucifer's rebellion occurred. Some like to put it pre-creation. The gap theory. Before. But I believe everything was created post day one. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Everything came past that. And, and, and Satan's rebellion only happened when man came on the earth. That's the only time he had inkling the, the iniquity that was in him. The driving mark that causes us to sin was in him. And he provoked, he, he deceived Eve. And he sinned and rebelled only after man was created. So you've got the Old Testament and the New. You've got heaven and earth. You've got Jew and Gentile. You've got number four. You've got prophecies and mysteries.
The prophecies are for the Jews. The mysteries are for the Christians. It tells us in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 that the Christians, we are the stewards of God's mysteries. We are the stewards, the custodians of God's mysteries. It tells us in Romans chapter 9 verse 4, it says that the Israelites are the people of the covenants. The covenants pertain, Romans 9 verse 4, the covenants pertain to Israel, not to the Christians. The covenants and the prophecies are for the Jew. The mysteries are for the Christian, for the body of Christ. So you've got this parity what is for the earthly people, what is for the Jew, and the mysteries, what is for the heavenly people, what is for the body of Christ, the Christian. Give none offense neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the body of Christ, nor to the church of God. In the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, the Bible tells us. We become Christians. Now, I've spoken to you before, there's seven mysteries. There's eleven in the New Testament, but there's seven that Paul speaks about. And I think it was actually number 77. I purposely did it as number 77, so I would remember future lessons teaching that I could quickly refer back to it. So my teaching number 77 speaks about the seven mysteries of God. What are the seven mysteries of God? Well, the first mystery is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a mystery. The Bible tells us that. That's the first one. I'm going to move quickly on the mysteries of God. The second one is Israel's blindness. It's how the mystery of God began with the blindness of Israel. Number 77, teaching tells you this. The closure of, of the body of Christ is a rapture of the church. Number three, it's a mystery. It tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 52. It's a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Number three. So you've got the body of Christ, how it began, how it ended, and then you've got the mystery of God's will, the indwelling, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That, that, that Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth, that the possessor of heaven and earth, dwells in us, is a mystery. Number five. How do we get into the body, the body of Christ? Is by the gospel. It's a mystery, the mystery of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, the mystery of the gospel. That's how we get in. Number six, the mystery of iniquity is how we get out. There's, a, there's iniquity working to try and keep us from getting into the body of Christ. And then lastly, is the mystery of godliness. It's what we've got to do, how we ought to live to stay in the body of Christ. And those are your seven mysteries. That's for us. These things were revealed to Paul. The prophecies were revealed by the prophets on earth to the Jew. The mysteries were revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ to us. There's a distinction between the prophecies, we're not the prophetic people, and the mysteries. We're the mystery people. We're the stewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're the stewards of the mysteries. And that is a parity. If you rightly divide, you'll see there's the prophet, you get the prophetic people, and you get the mystery people. Number five, you get the age of grace and the age of the law. Law and grace. We are currently in the age of grace. Heaven's windows are open to us. The door of heaven is open. It is not shut. It's calling sinners home. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can enter in by the grace of God into the body of Christ. The doors of the body of Christ is open. As I quote Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 13. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart 
God raised him up. That's all you've got to do to receive him. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we call on him, we shall be saved. During this period, we're in the grace period. The Jews were in the, in the law. The Old Testament, the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are still under the law. The book of Acts is a transition book. It moves from the law to grace. The 30 books of Romans to Philemon focus on the grace period. Where the body of Christ is in. That you can get in there by the, hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him as Lord and Savior. The books from Hebrews and James to the end to Revelation focus again on the law. We in this period of grace. After at the period of grace comes the seven years tribulation. And then after the seven years tribulation comes the 1,000 years millennium. And then after the thousand year millennium comes the new heaven, singular, and new earth. When I was young, I was just taught that if you get saved, you go to heaven. They didn't tell me about a new earth. Why does there have to be a new earth if I'm going to heaven? Because you've got an earthly person. And an heavenly person. You've got a Jew and a Christian. You've got the prophecies pertaining to the Jews. Romans chapter 3 verse 2. They have, to them was given the oracles of God. They have the oracles of God. They have the prophecies of God. They in... When, when the seven years tribulation happens after the age of grace, when the body of Christ is raptured, the age of grace concludes and it's the seven years tribulation, which is the fulfillment of the completion of the seven years from the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Because they're a prophetic people, they've got to fulfill the prophecy. We're not under prophecy. So we're not here. we under the mysteries. Under the body of grace. The Jews under the law. we under grace. So how will this be? It will be like the time here under the law. What will be important for them? What will be important for them is the book of Hebrews. The book of James. Through to Revelation. The Revelation... Basically, Revelation chapter 1, John re reveals a revelation of what happens on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day, man, uh, Peter chap chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says to us, it's like a thousand years. A thousand years unto the, the Lord is a day and a day a thousand years. So he shows us what happens on the Lord's Day. And essentially, this period is the Lord's Day. And many of the minor prophets prophesied about this. It's all focusing on this, on this, the seven years that still needs to be fulfilled. It's Book of Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 7. The, the, the week of Jacob's trouble. It still needs to be fulfilled. Who's Jacob? Jacob's Israel. The father of the Jews. Israel. Number six. You've got the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. This one, people don't divide this one. They don't rightly divide. I had a, a, a Bible teacher, a Bible lecturer tell me it's the same thing. It's synonymous. It's not synonymous. It's different. It's distinct. The kingdom of heaven is for the Jews. It's the thousand year millennial. The kingdom of God is for the body of Christ. When they get saved, they enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, it tells us in Luke 17 verse 20, it says, it, it comes up with observation. You can't observe it. You can't see it. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But His righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
It's not tangible. You can't see it. The kingdom of God is when we get saved, we enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a thousand years, millennium, when Christ is on the throne. Matthew 8 verse 11, it says, And many shall come from the east and the west, and they'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven is this thousand years. John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, who warned you of the coming wrath to come? The seven years tribulation. First they have to conclude the seven years tribulation, and then comes the thousand years peace, millennium, for the Jew. But we, in the grace period, we don't go through the tribulation because we're not the prophetic people. We're not the Jew. We're not Israel. We don't inherit the earth. So we get raptured, we get removed, we get taken out. We get snatched away. It's a parity. We get the heavenlies seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. With Christ Jesus. They inhabit the earth. They're the earthly people. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of heaven, but it's on earth. The new earth. The kingdom of God is in heaven. You've got to rightly divide. You've got to cut carefully the word of God. You've got to measure twice, cut once. You've got to understand these things. If you think the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is the same thing, you're not going to understand the end times. If you're going to think God's got one plan and He's done with the Jews, then you contradict Romans 11 verse 1, which Paul says God forbid God is not done with the Jews. He's got a plan for the Jews. He's coming back for the Jews. But before He comes back for the Jews, He's going to remove us. He's going to take us out of the way. Get into the body of Christ. The Jews are under the law. We're not under the law. They keep the Sabbath. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. It's the only commandment of the ten that Paul doesn't mention in Romans to Philemon. He mentions the other nine in Romans to Philemon, but he does not mention the Sabbath. We're not underneath the Sabbath. Tell that to your Seventh-day Adventist friends. Tell that to the Hebraic group movements who have moved away from grace. They've changed grace into licentiousness, into laws. Going back to the Jews, which we've come out. Once you're saved, you're saved out of the superstition of the Greek, and you're saved out of the law of the Jew. And you're coming to Christ. Number seven, the seventh parity, which you've got to understand that there's a difference, is that there's a day of Christ, and there's a day of the Lord. And if you've got modern translations, they're not going to divide the day of Christ from the day of the Lord. You're going to have one. You're only going to have the day of the Lord. You're not going to know about the day of Christ with the modern translations. When is the day of the Christ? The day of Christ is when Jesus Christ comes for the church. The day of Christ is here. It's the rapture. It's the going up. That's the day of Christ. It's there. You've got to rightly divide. When is the day of the Lord? That is the day of the Lord. It's for the Jew. The day of the Lord is for Israel. It's when the Lord comes back for Israel. And they look upon Him whom they have pierced. So He will return here at this period of time. Christ comes to earth. Here, the Christians are removed and taken to heaven. Christ comes to earth. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, Peter tells us, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8, the day of the Lord is like, is like a, a thousand years, a thousand years unto the day of the Lord. This whole period, essentially, is the day of the Lord. If you read the prophecies, and there's multiple prophecies, particularly with the minor prophets, they're focused on this period. 
The Lord is returning, but they're going to go through the seven years tribulation for Israel to fulfill the prophecies of the prophets. He's coming back. But for us, the Christian, He's coming back at the end of this grace period. We shall be removed. We shall be raptured. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord, I did a teaching on this. My number 10. I, number 10 was my teaching on this. I'm wrapping up. Um, sorry, I beg your pardon. Number 10 is the kingdom of God. This was number 39. 39. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Number th my teaching number 39, if you look up for it, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God was teaching number 10. The age of law, the age of grace. Have I got anything there for you? I'll pick it up um, 75 with regards to the tribulation of Job. Um, the prophecies and the mysteries, I've told you already, it's number 77. The Jew and the Gentile. Heaven and earth. Old Testament and New York. Number 69. Old Testament, New Testament. I'll pick it up number 69 here. So those are a couple of the pre-recordings. So what we've done here, rightly dividing, we've kind of looked at the Bible teachings that I've done thus far uh, over the last couple of years. And so the, if there's anything that you that you don't understand or you have a gap or you need some more information on, you can look at some of these former teachings which will help you understand that God has a plan for the church of God and He has a plan for the Jew and it's not the same plan and you need to rightly divide the word of truth to know what is for the Jew and what is for you Amen